I am really, really, really happy and lucky to be joined by the people I admire very much. My good friend Tony here and Anna Levinson for discussing. And uh, I don't know if you know where the title of this session comes from, they will get to feel better. Does anyone know? It's a good nerd way to start. The Samuel Beckett quote. Ah. So the original quote is something like, uh, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, fail again, fail better the quote I personally love, and it's very much the philosophy that we're going to talk about today for deliberate practice. So just to start off, I, I want to tell you about my experience of expertise. We're going to talk about psychotherapy expertise, what we know a little bit from the research and how we can try to improve it a little bit. But my first ideas of expertise actually came from music, because my parallel life is as an artist, as a musician. I play seven instruments. And if you ask any serious musician what they think about someone playing seven instruments, everyone will say he can't play them, any of them well. <laughs> you know? Because it takes a lot of hours, a lot of dedication to master one instrument. So of course I can't play any of them well. <laughs> but I started playing piano when I was five, and I had this old virtuoso piano lady teacher who gave me private lessons. And she used to tell me something, it's kind of dark to say to a five-year-old kid, but she kept saying it for 10 years because I was studying with her for 10 years, which is, you know, Alex, uh, unlike life, art is very fair. <laughs> because you get out of it exactly what you put into it. Okay? So I didn't understand that for like five years, 10 years or something. <laughs> But the truth is that in art, in music, in the piano, and then when I wear drums and bass and guitar and clarinet and saxophone, in all of those instruments, whatever time I did or did not use, I would notice the next time I played. So I came into the field of psychotherapy thinking it would be the same. The more time I put into studying books and watching videos, the better I would be as a therapist. You can imagine how well that turned out. <laughs> so I was 17 years old and I fell in love with Carl Jung of all people. And then I started reading all the psychoanalysts. Then I jumped into the humanist, then into Gestalt, then into cognitive behavior therapy. And it was all very cool. I loved it all. But there was a nagging feeling that I know how to talk about psychotherapy. I don't know how to do psychotherapy. If you actually put me in front of someone, knowing a lot of theory doesn't really help a lot. And this is actually something that Tony has written about, and a lot of our colleagues have written about, which is, there's a, and John has actually given a, a very, very nice definition, which is there's a difference between being an expert about psychotherapy and an expert in psychotherapy. So we can all write great papers and talk marvelously about psychotherapy, and then you watch videos of us doing therapy. Eh. I mean, we talked such a great game, right? <laughs> so, anyway, who the hell are we? Basically, I did this project after reading more than my eyes could bear, which was to try to interview all of my favorite psychotherapists. I thought, okay, some people must be good at this, even if I don't get it. So I'll just make a list of everyone, and I'll just try to interview them. And to my huge surprise, if I would send an email to a colleague in Portugal, they would never answer, or they would answer in three months. But if I send an email to Urban Yellow, he would answer me the next day. So I thought, okay, I can do this over and over. So I interviewed Wes Greenberg, and John Norcross, and Mark Goldfried, and Paul Octel, all the guys I've been reading for years. And it was really cool, and I learned a lot, and it was very nice. Then my biggest passion after that was watching videos, so I became a video junkie and a pirate, and I was always trying to find more psychotherapy videos. And finally, through reading the literature, I got into deliberate practice, which was just the idea of how can we actually take our work, learn from it, and in some way do some kind of, basically what I learned in music, which is some kind of methodology where I can actually see that the, the more I put into it, the more I get out of it, which I wasn't feeling before that. So I learned about Tony's book, which is that book for psychotherapists. I love it. 
I interviewed him, we kept in touch, and I got some consultation from him on delivery practice at the time. I was. So now I was able to push him to do a presentation today. And the basic ideas were just going to introduce the, the basic ideas of delivery practice, how it's associated, or how we think it could be associated with developing expertise in psychotherapy over time. And we're going to do a short live demo. We already actually did one this morning, not that sappy. So I'm going to step off, and we have very nice volunteers to help us with that. So I'm going to hand it over to Tony. Thank you, Alex. Um, so uh, raise your hand if you've uh, played a sport where you had a, a coach. OK, great. And what are the names of the sports? Just yell them out. Swimming, tennis, swimming, race, tennis, hockey, basketball. basketball. Okay, great. So, uh, just a thought experiment. Uh, imagine you went to your tennis coach, basketball coach, swimming coach. You said, "Coach, you know, I, I love this sport. In fact, I I think I'm kind of talented at it. I I want to do it professionally. I just don't have time for practice. <laughs> you know, like school, I got work. I got you know. So, uh, how about instead of practice, um, I just go to a lot of meets or a lot of games." How many hours do you need here in New York for licensure? Anyone know? How many supervised hours? Anyone? Any Five interns thousand. in the room? Or, is it a few thousand? Like two thousand or something? I know California is two thousand. So let's say two thousand. So let's say you go to your coach and you say, instead of practicing, how about I uh, just play in two thousand hours of games? I'll take notes on the games, I'll videotape the games, we can meet once a week for a few hours and we'll talk about the games and I'll get your advice. You know, I'll study it, and then I'll go to the next game. And we'll just do that week after week. It'll take, you know, maybe two years for 2,000 hours of games. And let's say you ask your coach, okay, would that prepare you to a professional level of skill? Maybe not like super expert, but professional level of skill in football, or soccer, or swimming. What would your coach say? No. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that would not fly. So let's, uh, who here has studied a musical instrument? What instruments? Piano. Piano, great. <laughs> Flute, okay. I imagine, same thought experiment, imagine you went to your piano teacher and you said, you know, I love the piano, in fact, um, uh, I, I think I want to be a professional musician someday. I just, you know, to be totally honest, I don't have time for practice, right? I got family, work, school. How about I do 2,000 hours of recitals and you can, you know, we can videotape them, meet once a week, talk about it, I'll get your feedback. Would that get you to a professional level of uh, musical skill? No. Okay. That is our training model for psychotherapy. Throw in a bunch of books and that kind of thing, and that's our training model for psychotherapy. Um, we get many, many hours of work experience, right? So a piano recital is not practice, a piano recital is work experience. Right? So a, a basketball game is not practice, it's work experience. And that's because you can't go back and say like, oh, you didn't hit the note just right, let's go back and do it again. Now let's go back and do it again. And by the way, let's do it 20 more times. Right? You can't do that during a recital. Right? I, I would guess everyone in this room has engaged in uh, many, many hours of deliberate practice in other fields. You might not have called it such, you might have called it uh, I mean, uh, whatever you call it, it was in sports or music or something in another field. Most fields require, as just part of the culture, there's no questions asked, way more hours of deliberate practice than work performance as part of training. We're defining deliberate practice as repetitive skill rehearsal in some kind of situation or condition that uh, simulates the actual uh, condition that you're going to be performing in. Not perfect simulation. In fact, they're often kind of contrived, forced simulations. Right? Like in basketball, your coach might ask you to, okay, we're going to try a, a free, you know, three-point throw, but I'm going to ask you to run back and forth across the field four times, court four times first, so you're out of breath, and then try. Right? And you would never actually do exactly that. <laughs> in a basketball game, right? Uh, who here uh, uh, did uh, piano? Raise your hand. Uh, how many scales did you practice? 
How many times did you practice? Not yeah. enough. Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So earlier today, someone said endless, and not enough is an even better answer. Because you know in your mind that the repetitive rehearsal is what moves those skills into procedural memory so you can perform them under stress. Right? A recital is stressful. Has anyone here ever felt any stress while helping a client? <laughs> Not just me. Have you read about it? <laughs> All right. So that's what we're doing with deliberate practice. Yeah. So and there are two types of deliberate practice that we can talk about. That's an important distinction. We can talk about solitary deliberate practice and with a coach. Usually, in most professions, you have both. So this is, comes from Anders Ericsson's work, like there's a classic 1993 paper he did studying mainly musicians, violinists, and it's interesting because the, what predicted expert performance was actually mostly the solitary delivered practice, like how many hours people outside of just being with a coach actually trained. But having a coach is very important to point out exactly what skills need to be repeat, uh, repeated, how it should be repeated, you know, to, to coach you basically. So this is also a big problem because if we want to translate deliberate practice research into psychotherapy, we want run into two problems. First, what do we focus on in solitary deliberate practice? So what should we be repeating and how should we be measuring that? And with a coach, where are you going to get a coach? Because, for instance, I got very involved in this after reading Tony's book and became very interested and we did some sessions and I was like, there's no one around me. They do supervision, but there's no one actually around me who even cares about most of this research let alone be a deliberate practice coach in psychotherapy. But that explains why it's so important for us today to also show you a little bit what it looks like solitary deliberate practice. Because most of us who get interested in this at this phase of the development will need to do a lot more solitary deliberate practice than to actually have a deliberate practice coach in psychotherapy. So we're going to show you a short video with Tony about how to do solitary deliberate practice but we also want to show you how to do the coaching part with the live demo, okay? So you get both ways. All right, thank you. Yeah, we've kept the slides short so we can really maximize the amount of time in the demonstrations. Um, so this uh, is deliberate practice I did regarding a client I had um, a, uh, a year or two ago, uh, uh, early 20s young man uh, who uh, came in with symptoms of depression. Things seemed to start well. We had a kind of quick agreement on the tasks and goals of therapy. We had a good bond. Uh, if you had read a transcript of the therapy sessions, it would have looked like things were going well. Uh, but uh, he was not improving. And the uh, outcome monitoring software I was using, in fact, uh, flagged him at risk of deterioration. So I uh, videotaped a session, and I showed the videotape to uh, one of my consultants. And when my uh, consultant started the video, he noticed almost auto immediately that the client was uh, disassociated. The client was talking, he was able to talk, but he was basically checked out. And the consultant asked me, he's like, oh, Tony, that's odd, you know, why don't you notice this? Because I, you know, I understand disassociation, I can teach disassociation. Um, you know, and how to work with anxiety. And I, I honestly had no idea why with this client I wasn't patching this. There, there was some kind of blind spot within me. So I uh, set up a solitary deliberate practice routine where I've got a video of the client on the screen. All right, you can't see the client for confidentiality reasons, but the video of the session playing on the screen is my old office. And uh, I'll show you just for a moment what I was doing, and then I'll walk you through what I was doing. So I had the video of the client playing. And so right now, just where physically do you feel this anxiety in your body? And so just right here, just where physically do you notice this anxiety in your body? Okay, so the session video is playing. The session video is a stimulus. All right, I'm not trying to follow the conversation in the set that's going on in the video. Okay, I'm practicing using very simple anxiety regulation techniques. 
right, helping the client notice somatic experiences uh, under the anxiety or in the anxiety. Simultaneously, if you notice there's a pause between what I was saying, I'm scanning internally within me to identify and label any anxiety symptoms or anything within me. So uh, I notice like tension in my shoulders. I notice uh, some kind of annoyance or frustration. I notice a, an urge to stop doing this, right, or disengage. So I need to keep playing. And so just right now, in your body, where do you physically notice the anxiety? So in this pause, I'm trying to be self-reflective. And so right now, where, where do you notice the anxiety just physically in your body? You know, so I'm saying it slightly differently each time. What I don't want to turn... So right, right here, right there, do you notice, where in your body do you physically notice the anxiety? Just right now, can we just pause you for a moment? Where physically do you notice the anxiety in your body? So one of the keys to deliver practice is repetition. And so right now, just where physically do you notice the anxiety in your body right now? And so I did this 20 minutes uh, at a shop. Was there a question in the back? Are you seeing the same clip of your client over and over no. again? I hit play on the video and I'm not touching it. I'm just letting it play. Uh, okay. And I'm not dialoguing with the video. I'm using the video as a stimulus to stir up my own countertransference. Okay. My hypothesis was that my countertransference was interfering with my ability to use therapeutic techniques that I actually knew in my mind perfectly well. Right? As I watched, as I did this, I did this at least three times for 20 minutes a time. I noticed a lot of tension growing in my body. I noticed a lot of shame, there was a lot of self-doubt, <coughs> and then underneath that it just kind of hit me that the client totally reminded me of myself when I was young. I spent a lot of time when I was young, a lot of dysregulated anxiety, disassociated, no one around me was noticing. And the client was in the same situation. And I feel it right now, and then I had a lot of grief. And I would cry, I actually cried for a while while watching the videos. And so I would I would sit and watch the video and cry and practice saying these lines. Right? It's kind of like when you're practicing a sport or you're practicing music. When it gets hard, you don't stop. In fact, that's when you're learning the most. When I sat back down with the client, I was much better able to notice my, to be self-reflective of my own countertransference, to be able to observe myself while intervening with the client. Yes? Can I ask, would you say that moment of insight is necessary or requisite for deliberate practice to then be effective, or no. not necessarily as the repetition? No. Okay. It's to be, my muscles were learning how to do it. Okay. Insight is great, but uh, if I had to pick one or the other, I would pick muscle memory okay. over insight. Okay. Um, so, because what I, my muscles were learning how to do is be self-reflective while experiencing, kind of, now I could, I could do this with clients without a lot of countertransference, no problem. I had other clients who were disassociating, no problem. This client stirred up so much countertransference that I, you know, whatever I had in cognitive knowledge was not enough. I needed in procedural knowledge. All right, this is why your coach will ask you to, you know, do another 50 free throws. Just a clarification yes. on, on, the, on what you were doing. Were you stopping the video at a place where you could have said what's going on in your body and then said it several times, checking with yourself, or are you just keeping that video going? And as you were keeping it going, were you saying, where are you feeling your body when you saw something from the client? No. no. You were just watching the video yeah. and then s using the skill. Well, the video is And checking yes. in with yourself. Exactly. The video is a stimulus. Uh, it, it, some of you might be familiar with when you learn tennis, there's a machine that sits there and throws balls at you. So you can sit there and, you know, practice 100 serves. Excuse me. That's the ball thrower. That's the stimulus sparking the countertransference that the client did. And it is roughly equivalent. Right? Now, practicing exactly when to intervene or exactly what to say would actually be a different skill. 
and we could set up a whole deliberate practice around that skill. Right? And that would be very different. You might notice when you learn music, when you learn sports, how many different skills did you practice? Right? I mean, dozens, hundreds, it, it's hard to count. Right? I, I would suggest psychotherapy is no less complex than any sport or any musical instrument. And something that's different about psychotherapy is we are asked to perform this very complex skill. We're expected to essentially improvise, right, to attune to each unique client that's going to be different, you know, present differently each session. We're expected to, you know, attune with them <coughs> eye to eye. If we miss a tune, if we don't, if we lose track of them for five seconds, they know it. There can be a rupture. And this is while they are often in very strong distress. As far as I know, there's no other field that expects professionals to attune with something in with someone in distress for such a prolonged period of time and perform very complex improvised skills. Yes? Do you have any thoughts <clears throat> about the possibility of, of having a loop, a video loop, where the, um, yeah. the stimulus yeah. for the comment keeps going again and again, which is much more like the, the uh, tennis ball machine? Yeah, so that, that would be a great idea. Uh, you, you could do that. Um, however, the one thing is that I need to have this skill generalized. I need to be self-reflective while I've got countertransference and stay engaged regardless of what the client says. And especially not knowing what the client's going to say next. And so if it's a loop, I could get habituated to it. So I, I guess I would do both. Yeah. You, you started with an observation from a, a colleague or a yes. coach. So one thing is the solitary practice, but the part of discovering where you should practice yes. is from the outside. Was, and that was crucial. Yeah. This was really a blind spot. I, I don't know about you, but my countertransference is often a blind spot for me. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, I used to hope that when I got licensed, it would somehow magically disappear, <laughs> and that unfortunately has not happened yet. Um, so uh, I still need expert coaches to point out my blind spots. I have not found a way around that. The practice is solitary, because I couldn't afford to pay him you know, to sit through this. What we're going to show next is practice with a coach. The idea, because this is where I come from, in Norway, there's a question of resources. The one yeah. thing is to have a supervisor or a coach. Yeah. The other idea is to have a team. Oh, yeah. So, so you don't necessarily need somebody who's <coughs> named a specialist or a coach. You no. But you are saying that it's important to have some kind of outside source to discover. I, I need an outside source to help me see my blind spots. I haven't found it. If you find a way to <laughs> see your own blind spots, please let me know. I, I haven't. And um, as far as I would, can see this is a career-long process. The reason I say it is that, that when you, if you underline the supervisor or the coach, you're creating a hierarchy very easily. But if you have a colleague who sure. would do the same trick. Absolutely. Yeah, some people prefer colleagues for various reasons, and they happen to also be a lot more affordable. So. <laughs> I guess I'm serious. About feedback. Uh, in a little bit, but we got to keep we got to keep moving. Okay. Um, I would say consider another cool analogy to the practice, I think, is jazz improvisation. Mm -hmm. Because I remember when I was very, very young, I went to a saxophone, uh, sorry, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. there was this virtual saxophone player called Ken Vandermark, like an avant-garde jazz guy. But, and it, from the outside, it just looked like random noises. But I love, I was completely enthralled. I loved it completely. And it took me many years to discover that it's not only is it not random, it was even more virtuoso than composition in a way. Of course, they're both very difficult things to do. But I found out that being responsive, like we talk about responsiveness in psychotherapy, because the context is always changing. Improvisation in jazz is like that. The context is always changing, you're always responding in the moment to that. And so that creates kind of an interesting parallel to one thing that we still haven't mentioned, which is in the practice, we always go back to basic skills. So it's very important, it's not like a hierarchy like, okay, I did this exercise for this time and now I can only, I should only practice the advanced skills. I mean, 
in basketball, you're practicing free throws forever, for the rest of your career. And in psychotherapy, and Tony has written brilliantly about this, it's basically the same in, in a certain sense. Like This kind of work, like experiential avoidance and awareness, it doesn't go away. So we're always going back to those basic same skills. Now, will we get more aware of that? I hope so. I hope I won't be so blind with after doing this for years. But, <laughs> but still, we go back many times to the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, another, common, <laughs> another common question we get uh, is, uh, does all deliberate practice have to focus on countertransference? And, and clearly not. This is a transmodal model of training. So uh, you can develop exercises for any model. So uh, I'll do workshops with uh, CBT therapists, and they're not so familiar with uh, countertransference. Um, and so we might do exercises around uh, Socratic dialogue. right? Or uh, with MI therapists, we might do exercises uh, around you know motivational inquiry, right? Or with IPT therapists, we might do exercises around uh, interpersonal skill training. Um, it, it's really what, whatever the the model of therapy is. I, ideally, my fantasy is that at some point every model of therapy is a book with a list of here's a hundred deliberate practice exercises you can do to improve your skills uh, in this model. So there are three aspects of deliberate practice because we have limited time today that we really want to emphasize, which are difficulty, repetition, and then homework. All right, these are three things that haven't necessarily been focused on a lot so far in psychotherapy. We're also going to pay attention to these. So Harley and Brittany have uh, courageously volunteered to be our uh, our victims <laughs> for the role play. So if you could please come up. I'm sorry, but we wanted to use that chair for the role play. Right, thank you. So this is Carly and Brittany. Thank you, Eric. We give them a round of applause. Um, I guess Carly, if you could sit there, please. It's right here. Hopefully, uh, okay. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? That's okay, because, yeah, this, that, that's okay. Perfect. Um, great. And so, uh, Carly, we haven't done this before. This is not scripted. Uh, Carly has described a, uh, I asked Carly to pick uh, a case, uh, a client from her caseload, um, uh, which uh, is currently challenging for her. All right, this is where we focus deliberate practice, so kind of our, what's just beyond our threshold of our ability. Um, I want to emphasize that the client, we're not kind of defining the client as a problematic or challenging client, right? It's challenging for Carly. That doesn't mean the client's doing anything wrong or Carly's doing anything wrong, right? Anyone else have challenges as a therapist? <laughs> okay, so this is normal. Um, and can, can you just describe briefly uh, an example of the challenge you had, the, the rupture. Sure. Um, so one rupture that we're going to focus on today was when um, the client came in and had described that he had a, didn't enjoy or didn't like the session, um, the previous session that I actually thought um, had gone well. <laughs> um, he explained that, um, number one, he thought that he was supposed to leave therapy like, feeling better, and he had actually left therapy last session feeling worse. <laughs> more anxiety, more um, sort of spinning thoughts, um, more defeated, and he also um, sort of um, externalized um, some of what we had talked about on TV. So what I mean by that is, we he was talking about concerns about his current relationship, and I had sort of reflected that it seemed like he was having doubts potentially about his relationship. He then um, had let me know that he thought I had sort of given him 
more doubts about the relationship than he had previously had. He was obsessing about the doubts. He was obsessing yeah. about the doubts and wondering, um, do I actually have these doubts, or right. like, did you tell me I have doubts and now I have them because you told me that I do? <laughs> Great. Has anyone else had similar experiences? Okay, so th this is very common, um, that there's ruptures due to misunderstanding, very well-intentioned, um, and uh, you, you probably were following, you know, a therapy model perfectly, and, but the, you know, client just takes it wrong and that's what happens, right? Um, now, the trick here is uh, how do we repair? And what we talked about was, Carly, was, you were saying it's kind of challenging to repair because you were experiencing anxiety. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anxiety in myself. Um, maybe like feelings of inadequacy and like not sure how to repair. Right. Yeah. Great. Though, I bet at that moment you could have written a really good paper on how to repair. <laughs> <laughs> right? In fact, I bet you could have taught a class on how to repair. <laughs> Am I wrong? Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. But this is this. I want to really underline this point. Okay, which is um, we have a lot of cognitive knowledge, but our ability to implement it in the moment while experiencing anxiety can be uh, impaired. All right. This is true for most professions. It's not just psychotherapy, right? What's different about psychotherapy is we are meant to sit and basically tolerate the anxiety of what the client is communicating to us. We're not <coughs> supposed to argue with the client. We're not supposed to convince the client that we have the best intentions. We're not supposed to basically distinguish the, the conflict. Right? We're basically almost expected to kind of cultivate the conflict in a way. Not really cultivate the conflict, but, but let it sit there and explore it. Right? We're kind of like um, uh, firemen. Uh, so, you know, a fireman runs into a burning building, grabs someone, throws them over their shoulder, and runs out. Right? They don't care if the person's kicking or screaming or whatever. A therapist goes in a burning building, says, hey, it's burning. H how about we go out the door? The person in the burning building says, oh, I don't know. I had bad experiences, you know, my childhood through that door. Let's not do that. <laughs> okay, how about we go out the window? You know, my colleagues will catch us on that bouncy thing. I don't know, I'm scared of heights, I really don't feel comfortable going out that window. Okay, how about we sit in the burning building while it burns down and build a relationship, and then over months talk about ways you might want to leave the building. <laughs> I haven't found any other field that's expected to do that. Right? Every other field you just throw them over your shoulder or knock them out or something. right? And so this is what Carly's dilemma was, which is all of our dilemmas, is how do you do some kind of repair while tolerating the anxiety, not trying to extinguish it? Right? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I'll show you some exercises on how to practice this. So Brittany is going to play the client. Okay. So, uh, you know, that probably won't work with the light in your eyes. <laughs> okay. How about if we move you guys right over here? So everyone can see you, and uh, you can leave the chairs. There's, there's chairs over here. And uh, I'm having the glaring light in your eyes. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you guys through this. So now, if you can look at Brittany and picture your clients. Okay. It <laughs> might be a challenge, but that's okay. Now. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to hold out your hand. Well, on a scale of ten, first of all, how much? Just picture. Look at look at Brittany. Picture your client. Picture uh, Brittany just said, you know, you really screwed up last session. I'm feeling worse. You know that kind of stuff. How much internal distress do you feel? Without telling us any details. How much anxiety, distress, or anything you feel right now? Not at the moment that it happened, but right now, on a scale of 1 to 10. 7. A 7. Excellent. So, uh, can you, so let's put out your hand like here, and that'll be like a 7. Okay? And you don't have to keep it there right now, but just for sake. Okay? I'm going to pause you guys, okay? I'm going to pause you guys a lot during this. Okay, so. so this is a, a fun difficulty scale we made. Now, if you remember from delivery practice with sports or music, 
Uh, if it was too easy, you're not really benefiting. Right? So maybe just playing a scrimmage with your friends, it's fun, it's great, but you're not, you know, really benefiting a huge amount. However, if you do a scrimmage with like the NBA player, the NFL player, it's too hard. Right? They're just going to cream you, you could actually get hurt, you're not going to benefit either. What we really want for deliberate practice to be effective is a difficulty somewhere right in here. This is called also the uh, zone of proximal development. Right? And so what Brittany just said is, we haven't even started the role play yet. Sorry, what Carly just said, picturing her client's face on Brittany is that already she's at a seven. Now I want to really emphasize this, because this is very common. Because you might have been thinking, you know, Brittany is such a friendly, mild-mannered therapist, how is she ever going to role-play the client? <laughs> we might already have a stimulus that could be too strong. Just picturing the client. Now I want to really underline this, because as I look back at my own psychotherapy training, I think that at least a quarter of the time, I was in a too hard difficulty. I was disassociated. Now, I grew up disassociated a fair amount, so I know how to talk when I'm disassociated and I can just kind of go about life and I look like I'm functioning, but I was not benefited. And it's a little shocking when I start to think about this with my current supervisees, how many of them I'm asking them to somehow internalize what I'm teaching them while they're here. Now, they can be compliant, you know, they can be very polite, and they want my signature on their paperwork, so they will go through the motions. So I just want to really emphasize this. Okay, now, great. So since you're in a seven, we actually don't want to up the stimulus anymore. So just sit there and just sit there. Great. Now, Carly, um, what I'm going to ask you to do is kind of a two-step process. One, notice your internal anxiety, distress, or any positive feelings, really anything within you. Try to label it. So we're building self-reflective capacity. Uh, you could also call it uh, self-mentalization capacity, psychological capacity, mindfulness capacity. Everyone's got a different term for it. But every model I know of says this is important. OK, so you're doing that. And then try saying some kind of uh, repair, uh, no intervention, uh, to print. I first really want to thank you for sharing that information with me. Um, I'm sure it would go hard to let me know that you were that well after our session last time. Could yeah. you speak a little louder, please? Sure, sorry. Um, and in fact, it made you feel actually worse throughout the week when you really didn't expect to feel better. Great. And if you can't hear every word, that's okay. Just in your mind, is she saying a repair, a repair technique? Now you notice I'm asking her to use her own language. I do not want her to turn into like a Tony robot, right? And if we do enough repetitions with my language, that could actually impair her, right? So it, she could really use any language that, you know, there's a million different ways to do a repair. So it's great repair. Now if you could hold out your hand, right, at the difficulty level, is it higher, lower, or the same? Try to hold out your hand. Okay. Um, a little. A little lower. Just a, a notch. A notch. <laughs> okay, great. So that's still a notch lower would be like here. Now, of course, we're in front of a big audience and everything, and so that could be contributing, you know, to <laughs> 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 right? Just potentially. Yeah, just potentially. Um, and uh, sitting in front of all your future reviewers. <laughs> so, um, and so, but, but that's okay. Uh, really what she's learning is how to be self-reflective while staying active. Right. Each of those is important, but we have to do both simultaneously for 50 minutes at a time. All right. So, great. So, uh, excellent work. Can you try again? Now this time, hold out your hand at the seven. So like, wherever that was. Try to keep your hand there if you can. And we'll go through the two steps. First, notice any anxiety, distress, particularly anything in your body, which can be really valuable. I'm not asking her to label that out loud to a room full of strangers or reviewers, right? 
boundaries is super important here. <laughs> Just notice, right? Us knowing about your inner world is not required for you to do uh, therapy. You knowing about your inner world, right? Right? And then when you're ready, try another repair line. If your distress goes down, try to move it down. Okay. And if it goes up, try to move it up. So again, I really want to thank you for sharing that feedback with me. Um, and I would encourage you to continue to let me know, even in the moment, how things are going and how you're feeling and what you're thinking about what we're doing together. Excellent. And so your hands at roughly the same level? Um, or is it going down? Look. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Try it again. So start with a self-reflective scan. So shame, embarrassment, self-doubt are also very common experiences. So if so, you just notice those. Anything in your body, anything like that. And then when you're ready, do the intervention. So thank you so much for sharing that feedback with me. Um, I think it's really important to hear what you're thinking and feeling about the work that we're doing, the work that we're doing together. I would encourage you to continue to let me know how you're feeling and what's going on with your extension. Great. Your hand's dropping. Well, yeah. It might be because I'm asking you. <laughs> 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 but it's, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit easier. A little easier. Yeah. So that was a third time. Let's do it again. OK. So I want to really thank you for providing that feedback for me. I know it must have been hard for you to be able to share that with me and I want to let you know that I really appreciate your feedback and would encourage you to continue to let me know how things are going in the moment for you as we're working together. Great. Is it getting a little easier? Yeah. Try it again. <laughs> now, let's pause for a moment. Did anyone ever have complex feelings towards your athletic coach? <laughs> 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 or your music coach? Now, that didn't mean you were doing anything wrong or they were doing anything wrong, all right? But this is something that we really want to pay attention to in deliberate practice, really all supervision, but particularly deliberate practice, is as I ask Carly to keep doing reps, she's probably going to have some kind of complex feelings, frustration, annoyance, disappointment, something with me. It's really important that she knows that that's okay, all right? I'm not going to ask her to process it right now or anything, but just to acknowledge that, all right? You guys might have some complex feelings as well. So, <laughs> again. Um, so I want to thank you for providing me that feedback. First of all, um, I think it must have been hard for you to let me know um, that you think things are going so well, um, specifically in the last session. And I really appreciate it. Yeah. Great. So where are we on a scale of 1 to 10? Um, oh, great. Okay, so we brought it down. Right? So that's the effects of repetition. So what that means is that if we keep doing it without a stronger stimulus, it's not going to be so helpful. So we've got to up the stimulus to make it uh, more challenging. <laughs> so Brittany, can you respond uh, with, you know, some kind of rupture of state? To what she said? Yeah. <clears throat> It's, 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 it is really hard to just be honest with a person. So. Can't hear you. It, it, sorry. It's, a, it's a rough, I'm sorry, they can't, it's going to be really hard for them to speak loudly enough, but she's basically saying you didn't hear me. Mm -hmm. I'll translate. <laughs> so I, I don't want you guys to have yeah. to speak too loud. Sure. And so where's your hand now? How, um, how hard is it hearing that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> at, a, at a 10. But, um, back up to like, <laughs> Seven or an eight. Yeah. I, I want to highlight this. Because an eight is our limit. And I want to show how quickly we went from, what was it, a two or a three to an eight. All right? Now, uh, 
it, this can happen super quickly. In fact, I've found again and again and again, the challenge for me as the coach is to bring the difficulty down, not up. And I think it's just because we're working with such challenging emotions, and any time a client has a problem with therapy, it's personal. It's about us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and uh, I mean, it might not be about us, but at least they're experiencing it as about us. It can be hard to remember. And sometimes it really is about us. <laughs> uh, so, so can you try again, but kind of keep it much shorter? Something to the effect of maybe like, I don't understand what you're saying. Sure. And I, I'm sorry, let's start again, sure. and you reply like that. Okay. Yeah. Just start with the self-scan. This is super important. If we move right into the repair without the self-scan, then she's not going to be prepared when she sits down with the client. I first just wanted to really thank you for the feedback that you provided. Um, I know it must have been hard to share this information with you, um, but I really appreciate you doing so. It's really helpful to me to um, work together, and I would encourage you to continue to provide feedback to me going forward with what you're liking or not liking. somewhere between what you just did and the last one, right? Now, so normally uh, I would uh, be pointing to this chart and be asking Carly to point on the chart where she is, right? So it would be a visual thing. Can anyone guess why I'm asking her to move her hand up and down? It's so there's a behavioral component. It makes it very concrete, and I'm hoping that even if she starts to blank out in session, her body will remember that she should be doing something. We're kind of anchoring the self-reflection in the movement. All right. Um, something else I want to point out here is these down here are symptoms that uh, we've kind of developed based on anecdotal experience for when uh, the difficulty for the trainee is good and when it's too much. All right. Uh, these are based off of anecdotal experience, different anxiety pathways in the body. These are not empirically based. All right. I, I really want to underline that. And it's a little scary for me that we do not have empirically based rigorous system for telling if trainees are working over their threshold. Because I'll tell you, every athletic, every sport does. All right, you don't want to work with a coach who cannot spot some uh, signals that you're working beyond your capacity. Has anyone in here used a uh, heart rate monitor for uh, you know on your machine or whatever? Right. So every professional athlete learns to really carefully monitor their heart rate. Professional cyclists know their exact heart rate. And they'll be able to tell you, okay, if I go up at this angle for this long, it'll go up this much, and then I can bring it down this much. Yeah? What do you do when you realize when you come back that that outside the process? Yeah, which happens very frequently. So uh, the first thing I do is try to lower the stimulus. And so that's what we did uh, with Brittany. Right? We said, okay, instead of responding, kind of soften your response. Right? Uh, if I've had many situations where even just sitting down, the therapist tells me they're at a 10. Just the countertransference is so strong. So what I do there is I'd hire uh, Carly, you can try holding that so it blocks Brittany, and talk to the piece of paper. Does that lower it enough? Try talking in a high-pitched voice. Try turning around and looking that way. Whatever it takes. Right? One of the subtexts is you're helping the therapist build some sense of uh, agency. Yes, please. Um, uh, Carly, you seem to know how to do a repair. Yes. You, you had the skill. Yes. So what do you do with a student who's like, oh right. my god, I don't know what to say, and you're saying, well, don't give them the word. Oh, right, so really good point. 
yeah, so, you know, Carly's got some experience, you, you know what I mean, this isn't her first rodeo, and so, uh, and with a, this would not work with a first year trainee right out of the gate, right? I, I would give them words uh, to practice, uh, but I would say that you're going to kind of try these on for size, and you can kind of memorize them for now, but then later on we're going to really try to ditch them and find words that work for you, which will be quite different. Yeah. Because that it, could be, it could be way up nine or ten yeah. when they have no clue what to say. Yeah, I might even give them a script to read yeah. to start, sure. You know, uh, the other thing is I wouldn't be asking them to do both self-reflective capacity and intervention at the same time mm -hmm. as a first year training. Mm -hmm. Right? I'd start with one, then the other, and then gradually integrate. It's kind of like, you know, when, uh, when, when, you, uh, when my daughter learned to ride a bike recently, and she just learns to like go straight first, and then you learn to kind of turn a little, and then you learn to like brake, or whatever it was. Right? So, great question. Uh, I, other quick, but what's our time? We're, we're, we're good? Okay. Um, and, and why don't we pause the roll player? Thank you both. Okay. We have a round The question, please. So I don't know if you're going to get to this later in your presentation, but besides building that self-reflection and then tying it also to the behavioral movement that you're describing with the hand raising and lowering, what? So if you find yourself in the moment in the room in a session with a or client, and you find yourself in the nine and ten zone already yes. off the bat, yes. what would you recommend that people who are in the moment, yeah. how to break. Because if you're dissociated, yeah. that's hard to one recognize immediately, yeah. and then two to bring yourself out of it. Yeah. So uh, I mean, great question. Uh, and, and there's a whole series of exercises that I had to develop for myself on basically disaster recovery, like when I'm having a meltdown with a client. Uh, I was helping a client for a while uh, who uh, came in with pretty pronounced borderline personality disorder. She'd been hospitalized. And she'd been fired by or quit her past. 12 therapists, you know, self-harm, the whole thing, suicidality, the whole thing. And I found that just sitting down with her, I would be here. Right. I mean, literally just sitting down, like no one would say anything. And so I had to practice exercises to be like, how can I ground myself? One thing I did was I would watch videos of her, and I would look between her eyes, like at the bridge of her nose. Try doing that. Just look at the, between my eyes right here, and you might notice that the emotional activation you experience goes down. But I can't tell that you're not looking at my eyes, right. right? Or I might practice changing the subject while talking with her, which is not ideal, but it's better than me sitting there disassociated. Because to touch on what you're talking about with you want to stay engaged and active and you're attuned to the client while managing this uh, anxiety. Ideally. For, ideally, with the deliberate practice. But for me, for example, when I'm anxious, I avert my gaze. Yeah. So how? That is, I can get like focusing on the bridge yeah. of your nose can do that, but my immediate reaction sure. is to look, yeah, like focus my gaze on somewhere else. Yeah, so that's called an experiential avoidance reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone has it. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I used to think the goal was to get rid of them somehow, sure. and now I've realized that's not possible. The goal, my goal, is to now be able to recover. Well, first of all, observe that it's happening, and then recover. And so that's what I'll practice doing. I'll practice observing and then recovering. I spent a fair amount of time watching uh, YouTube movie clips of uh, frankly painful movies uh, because they would push me up here and then I would practice just self-observation while in that state. Where I'd talk to the movie and try to just be, stay active while I was experiencing it. The short answer though is I would guess that if uh, you were to experiment with this, you would find your own exercises customized just for you. Sure. Right? Right. Thank you for that. Yeah. So I was trying <laughs> to think of, a, of an, another reason why I might want to practice or help someone by teaching them to practice deliberately. And what I thought about was the difficulty of working with somebody like on, uh, on the spectrum, autism spectrum, sure. so, um, or somebody who gives exquisitely detailed descriptions of their cat, as they talk about, where they live. Sure. Um, what would you recommend for deliberate practice with therapist Boyle? 
Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great because, one. Because that's, yeah, I always somebody skis a lot. I mean, sure. these are people who would not like to trigger sure. anxiety, except anxiety about the boredom they have been feeling. Sure. <laughs> Uh, so the, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, I, I'd be really curious to, to find out. I haven't done that yet, but that, that would be great. Um, so what I would do is we'd sit down, I'd say, you know, let's look at a video of the client or do a role play or somehow uh, simulate the boredom. Right? We've got to get you into a bored state. This is state-dependent learning. Right? This is super important. A lot of the time when we're learning psychotherapy skills, we're in a calm, relaxed, attentive state, which is not what we always are on in, uh, in therapy, all right? Like, so we gotta get you bored, first of all. And you could watch some movie that bores the heck out of you. That would be fine, right? Uh, or, you know, your colleague could sit there and talk about something that you find completely boring, all right? And then what you wanna do is find exercises to, inter to try to intervene in a way that you would want to act in the therapy session. And that depends on your model, it's different for different models, right? And you just want to keep checking and make sure that the challenge level is here. It might be that if your colleague is too boring, it's too hard. And so you might have to have your colleague kind of talk about something you find just slightly interesting. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then gradually shift. As you got better at it, gradually shift to more and more and more point. There's one maybe just important caveat here about yeah. the difficulty chart, which is, and I've seen this happen in Tony also, which is sometimes a stimulus is so evocative that you dissociate so much, you think it's an easy the stimulus. <laughs> like people will tell you, yeah, nothing's getting stirred up, and they can't even look at the stimulus, they can't hear the stimulus, but they report that, yeah, it's like a, a free because they're completely you know, out of it. So that's important, especially if you're being a coach, that's very important. Really good point. Yes, please. In the personal example you shared with us first, yeah. it involved you becoming aware of the underlying emotional sure. theme involved. Sure. And I think that played a role in helping you start sure. to loosen it up. Do you ever try to facilitate that kind of deepening awareness for the training? So, you know, I'm a psychodynamic therapist and we love getting insight about our past. So, I mean, that just kind of comes naturally for me. And, uh, and when I'm consulting with especially experienced uh, psychodynamic therapists or, you know, maybe EFT therapists or, you know, anyone in that kind of umbrella, uh, I, I would absolutely ask them to reflect. I, I, they don't have to tell me, but I was ask them to reflect. Um, if I'm working with a beginning trainee, uh, I might very consciously not. I might, in the introduction, say that you might have insights, and that's great, but the insights uh, won't necessarily be uh, necessary uh, for your benefit, all right? It's more the repetitive rehearsal of performing. So is the mechanism of change the trainees cycle by cycle learning, oh, I'm not helpless here? Oh, I can do this. I think that's part of it. Yeah. I mean, we really haven't studied this that much, mm -hmm. so it, this really needs to be studied. But I think that's part of it. it just one second, because something we skipped, which is really important, is homework. So this is typically something we haven't done in psychotherapy. We do a lot of like kind of writing homework and reading homework, but the, I'm talking about behavioral rehearsal homework. So what I would uh, assign to Carly for uh, homework is I'd say, do this role play for 20 minutes a pop or work with your video for 20 minutes a pop, uh, maybe once a week or once every other week, and do the exact same exercise. And unless she did a bunch of that homework, I'm not sure if this would stick. All right. Oh, we have to move to, okay. Uh, Hannah? Or, uh, thank you for all the questions. This is really great. I'm sorry, we do have to move on. Let me pull up your slides. I'll use it. You told them up there. It'll be enough. Can I just start talking? Right. I'll do an internal. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Alex and Tony, for inviting me. Uh, the email asking me to do this came at a perfect time. It was uh, I had already assigned uh, Tony's book, Deliberate Practice, 
to be read by my class, or at least some of the chapters in it. So I was immersed in it. It's a great book. I know a discuss usually doesn't get up and do a little spiel about the presenter's book. But it, it's a great book. I think you've got a taste here of why the book might be so appealing, is that uh, Tony goes through uh, the material, he grounds it in whatever research is available, and I'm just dying to see the research um, this is for practice, but grounds it in whatever research is available, but self-discloses a lot, and shares about his journey, uh, finding what's helpful in and what's not. And um, there's such a, a compassionate stance that he takes throughout it, that it was very appealing uh, to my students uh, who, you know, are so shame-based so often and shame in the learning to now see such normalizing. Um, so this is Rancho La Puerta, and um, I was taken there by two friends for a big birthday. It's in northern uh, Mexico for relaxation and rejuvenation. It was wonderful. Uh, the hiking, the classes, guided repetition at my threshold of strain. These are attorney's words. And I ended up being in, in better physical shape and learning how to cook with fresh produce and meditation. It was just ideal. And then the last class at the ranch was what's called taking the ranch home. And the group who's been there for a week uh, it sits down and the person says, you've had a wonderful week. But if you go home and don't take what you've learned here and practice it at home, you've just had a good week. But this could make a difference in your life, right? So I'm wondering here if you could take deliberate practice home. We know from the presentation today that being a passive learner, one of many observers, going to standalone workshops or symposia with no follow-up, and not making a commitment to continue the learning does not make for improved outcome. And that's what you've had today. So can you take this home, whether you're a clinician, a supervisor, a teacher, or a researcher, you can take what you've learned here home. But it does take a commitment. Now, I thought when I originally started, before I really read Tony's book, deliberate practice, well, I, I already do that. Um, I'd become a certified, emotionally focused therapist and supervisor, and there were weeks of didactics and role plays and small groups and core skills training and videotape sessions and so forth. But that was years ago. And I think there's been some drifting away. And, and so I decided to make, after uh, really seeing some of Tony's videos and reviewing some of the other research to start more of a deliberate practice. And, um, and so I, I'm asking you, maybe you could make an active commitment to take some of this home in whatever setting seems to make sense. As I say, if you're a teacher, could you see doing this with students? If you're a supervisor, could you see doing this with supervisees? If you're a therapist, could you see doing this yourself to better your outcomes with your clients? So I'm going to ask you for the next five minutes or so to turn to the person next to you, or maybe on your lap given how crowded the room is, and for a few minutes talk about the following. Share, yes, I'm already doing deliberate practice. And be specific because that person listening to you would be curious. How's it going? How's it working? What you do? Or how could you use deliberate practice? How could you ascertain a weakness, for example? Or how might you correct a weakness? Or how might you assess the effectiveness of the change? <coughs> okay, you get the idea? So just a, a kind of getting in it more actively rather than remaining passively. Turn to the person next to you for a couple of minutes, then exchange. Are you doing deliberate practice? Are you intrigued to do deliberate practice? How might you go about it? All right? Give it a try. You know, but I'm not going to tell you we're going to keep it uh, secret. It was excellent. That was, that was really cool. I had no idea. That was really awesome. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody. especially thank you to our volunteers. We have another round of applause. Thank you for all the really good questions. Um, I just want to direct you to 
this website where uh, Alex and I are creating video exercises that are free. Um, some of them we're experimenting with using a more uh, colorful style. Uh, we have the oddball version. Yeah, the square, yeah, the square version. version, which is like the normal version. Uh, it, so if you're in for an experience, try the oddball one. My wife thinks it's going to be the end of my career. She's like, I'm literally, it's like, you can't show this uh, so, um, But we have a mixture of, we use movie clips for stimuli. Like this is from Google Hunting, and then uh, Alex has made some cool uh, kind of custom videos as yeah, well. Yes, so we created custom videos, original videos with stimulus, so that you can practice towards video to use as a stimulus for your own practice exercises. So we're going to keep updating the website with yeah, new videos and new exercises. And, new exercises. Yeah. and what I ask is just if anything works really well for you, please let like, let me know so we can keep continue improving them. All right. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.